This is Bewilderbeasts, an infotainment show dedicated to inspiring curiosity for all ages by investigating the ways animals intersect at humanity. I am not a historian, an ethologist, a researcher, a scientist, a zoologist, a trained audio engineer, or an expert in, well, anything. Y'all, I'm lucky if I can remember to put my clean laundry in the dryer before it gets funky. And while I make every effort to present things as accurately as I can with a fun flair, I'm going to mess up. And that's okay. I hope I've given you a nice place to jump off from on your own adventures into curiosity. Or at the very least, I've given you the key to win your next round of trivia. and welcome to Bewilderbeasts. I'm your host, Melissa McKee McGrath, still recording in a new podcast studio closet underneath the stairs. On today's episode, we're going to be doing a revisit through Africa. All right, let's go. Good morning, y'all. I have a few notes up here at the top, and then we'll get right to the episode. One. If you happen to have November 21st open on your calendars, there's something you might be into. There's this free virtual book launch for Dr. One Pagan's newest book, and y'all are going to love this. It's called Drunk Flies and Stoned Dolphins, A Trip Through the World of Animal Intoxication. Why am I promoting someone else's book launch? Well, several reasons. One, I saw an image of the cover promoted on social media several months ago and tweeted it saying, well... This is the intersection of everything that makes me happy, science, animals, and weird stories. One saw that tweet and asked if he could send me a copy in advance to read, which I salivated at the opportunity. It was such a fun read. Truthfully, it's really written for the layperson in mind. And that's not all. One was trying to figure out how to do a book launch in the still ongoing pandemic that would be able to include as many people as possible. To the internet, live stream, Batman. But talking to yourself about your own book? That's not fun at all. Y'all, he asked me to join him in bringing his book into the world at the virtual book launch on the 21st. So, if you want to ruin the illusion as to what I look like, there's no going back. Once you see this, you can't unsee it. But it will be a great time talking about bees who act as bouncers for the hive in the event that intoxicated bees roll up after a bender, how fruit flies weaponize alcoholic fruit, and how dolphins reinvented the old idea of puff puff pass using puffer fish to get high. And if this is something that you're into or think is funny, follow at Bald Scientist on Twitter or email O R Pagan, P is in Peter, A G is in Giraffe, A N is in Nancy at Yahoo.com to get access to the live stream. And we will both put the audio up in our feeds as bonus episodes. So if you can't make it, it's okay. I will put a link to his announcement in the show notes so you can follow along as well. In the Patreon-only announcement of this, I gave both the wrong date and the wrong book event, as Dr. Pagan has a few fun things happening in the weekend after his book launch. So to be clear, 1121, November 21st, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, YouTube Live, and email orpagan at yahoo.com or tweet at Bald Scientist on Twitter. By the way, that's one of my favorite Twitter handle names ever. It's really clever. Or you could just reach out to me via all the ways that you already know how, and I can get you in touch personally with Dr. Pagan. Two, I started this week pretty sick. <clears throat> As you can hear, still a little bit funky. So it wasn't COVID, it was just a bad cold. And I ended up playing a video game all day instead of researching a new episode for y'all. I did finish one on the bird of the year going baddie for patrons. So if you want a new episode, support at any level and you get access to that RSS feed. There are five episodes in there right now and a new one just for patrons every month. That said, you are not missing out, which leads me to number three. Today's episode is a collection of stories, weirdness, history, and science intersecting in African animals. I had the pleasure of chatting with a woman who was really, really, really kind and supportive and just 
honestly the kind of role model that I needed as a wayward kid. This was my high school chorus teacher, and she's now a history teacher, Mrs. Jones. Cue the counting crows. 90s kids will get it. She was starting a history segment on Africa, and we got to talking, and I knew that I had a few stories here that might tie in or at least maybe get the kids thinking about different ways of looking at history and science. So this week's episode is for the students at RSU 40 in Waldeboro, Maine. Madame Valley represent. Go Panthers. These are likely not stories that will pertain exactly to what they're doing with Mrs. Jones, but my hope with this show is to find interesting and unique ways to get kids interested in the world around them. It has always been the goal of this show. No matter how dark or silly or ridiculous this show gets, it's always been to try to fascinate kids and people into looking at the world around them in maybe a slightly new light or to connect the dots that have always been there in a way that kind of ignites a fire or a spark. I am going to level with you. I hated history classes as a kid. And there were lots of reasons for that. And I'm going to throw my poor dad under the bus. I am so sorry, dad. I, I don't think he listens to the show. I will find out, I'm sure. But truthfully, um, when I was a kid, my dad made me and my brother and sister dress up in Revolutionary War reenactment gear. Yes, Hamilton, before Hamilton was, quote, in. I was like seven and had to wear so much wool in hot, humid Maine summers, spend all my weekends at the fort, Fort Edgecombe, if you're interested in Maine, churning butter, running around getting heat exhaustion, because remember, wool. And perhaps the worst part of it, besides feeling horrifically out of place and just wanting to be normal, was that my brother got to carry a musket, and because I was a girl and we were trying to be historically accurate, albeit with modern underwear, I was not allowed to play with the musket. I wasn't allowed to march in parades with a gun, any of it. I just got to wear a bonnet and a shawl and a dress, which, for budding tomboy me, was not something that I was interested in doing at all. I hated it. So high school history was just memorizing dates and a lot of it, you know, about the Revolutionary War, which was kind of triggering. Like these dates, they just didn't connect to anything that I liked or enjoyed. And it was tedious and I did fine. I was, I tested well, but I always test well, but I didn't like it. Um, and then when I started this show and met a horse named Beautiful Jim Key, the horse who could do math and was owned by William Key, the self-taught veterinarian and freed slave who traveled the world around going to the World's Fair stage and got two million kids to vow kindness to animals and promised never to teach with whips. The very basic building blocks of today's ASPCA and MSPCA where I worked and positive reinforcement dog training ethos. But he couldn't go on trains in the 1800s that his horse was allowed to go on because he was a black man in America at the turn of the 1900s. And the stories through the connection of animals made history interesting to me. And I was 39 when I started this show. So keep that in mind, students of RSU 40 or any kids anywhere, really. If you are not connecting to the material, it's okay. Is there a subject that you really like? Ridiculous stories, irony, Darwin award-worthy cautionary tales, pharmacology, astronomy. All of these things also tie into subjects that you may be struggling with. So find a way to connect it to something you are passionate about, that you love, that excites you, and then the information will stick. So today's clips show will involve all animals from Africa, Q-Toto's or Weezer's version, and it's going to look a lot like last season's format, where we're going to have three segments all on a theme. And the first answer is the old age question, why are farmers painting eyes on cow butts in Africa? The second, we're investigating genetics through evolution's swing and a miss, the dwarf giraffe. And third, how a lemur, indigenous to the funky island of Madagascar off of Africa's coast, ended up in a preschool's playground in San Francisco. (laughs) For more on African animals, particularly one that really does intersect in a huge way with history, please re-listen to Diamond Smuggling Pigeons about the history of the diamond mining in Africa's Diamond Coast. It's dark, it's detailed, and there are no good current answers as to what to do next. This was Season 2's opener, Episode 41. And if you are a patron... 
Remember the hippos? That they're an African species? But thanks to Pablo Escobar, the famous drug lord wanting a few of these hippos for his private pond in South America, is now home to the largest invasive species on the planet. Go re-listen to the Cocaine Hippos episode for that very detailed history. And with that, y'all, let's jump in the Wayback Machine and revisit some of these African animals and when sound quality was just a figment of my imagination, particularly episode one segment, which I had to re-record because I just didn't have the microphone set to the right output back then. And luckily, I kept that script and I updated it a little bit for today's audience. All right, let's go. Did you know that farmers paint eyes on cow butts to protect them from predators? Now, where I live, cows live in fields and there are very few natural predators, except us. But in places where cows live alongside lions and jaguars and all other apex predators, cows are easy pickings and delicious dinner. They are often picked off by wolves, large cats, and, you know, other big animals. But according to a study from Communications Biology, when researchers painted eyes on bovine booties, they observed lions would not pick those cows. And while this sounds silly, it makes evolutionary sense. Think about butterflies. Some of them have eye-shaped patterns on their wings to confuse predators. It's hard to sneak up on someone that you think is watching you. So let's look at lions. They attack by sneaking up on their prey. They're called ambush predators. So if they are fooled into thinking that they're being watched, the lions lose their advantage. And according to Mental Floss, my favorite website on the internet, this works on humans as well. Not that farmers don't kill cows with eyes, but, but we also fall prey to thinking that we're being watched. For example, when bikes were parked near signs featuring eyes, there were 65% fewer bicycle thefts. So what does that mean for butt bespectacled bovine? Well, for now, it appears that the eyes painted on the butts work well, but if all cows had these markings, predators might just get desperate and still attack the cows. And over time, lions might get wise to this. So if this works long term, this could go on to not just save farmers' bovine bounty. It may also serve to save the lives of the lions. Botswana, where the farmers and researchers are doing this wacky paint job on cow butts, is home to one of the largest lion prides in the world. There are over 3,000 lions that call Botswana home. And if, if the lions and leopards, both ambush predators who like to sneak up on their prey before doing a murder, if they can leave the cattle alone, they are also at reduced risk of being hunted themselves by the farmers seeking revenge or even just to prevent more cattle loss. Often, the Botswanan farmers will use any means necessary to protect their flock, including gunpowder and poison, even though this is illegal in Botswana. However, those who are resorting to these illegal measures are not the farmers who can afford state-of-the-art cow containment systems. These are the poorer farmers, poorer sustenance farmers, so this is much harder to keep your cows alive. At night, they'll often herd their livestock into stockades made out of logs or thorns to deter the lions. And they'll also maybe use barking dogs, and if they're particularly desperate, which they are, they will even chase off lions with spears. Y'all, a spear. How did we get from thorns and hope to painting eyes on the, well, I'll say it, the tastiest part of a cow? Eventually? Well, on a field trip, conservationist Neil Jordan watched a lion stalk an impala for 30 minutes, giving up on the antelope after it turned and looked at the predator. Now, I'm imagining the impala did the two-finger thing to his eyes, then the lion's eyes, then back to his eyes. But Neil Jordan had a thought. Maybe it was the eye contact that stopped the stalking sequence of the lion. Scientists are concerned about lions. As more people are using the land, the lions are losing out. This is a tale as old as time. The International Union for Conservation of Nature estimates that the lion population has declined by more than 40% over the last two decades. The two biggest challenges that have affected this number are unsurprising. Habitat loss because of people and humans killing lions to save livestock. There are not many non-lethal means of protecting cows. 
unless you count using thorns and chasing off with spears, but these are not particularly practical. So a little paint on a cow butt might be well worth the effort. And with fewer lions and leopards attacking and killing livestock, the more likely they can all live in relative harmony. So the eyes have it, for now. Stay tuned, we'll see. So kids say the darndest things. And as a mom, I frequently hear and say things that I never, before having children, would have ever imagined. So for starters, here's here's a real conversation that has happened in my house in my lifetime since having a child. I had said to my daughter, don't put your fingers in the dog's nose. It's not nice. How would you feel if he put his paw up your nose? Don't ever do that again. Five seconds later, no, no, wash your hands before you put your fingers up your nose. You just had them up the dog's nose. I mean, wait, no, don't put your fingers up anyone's nose. Yours either. Don't, it, you know, just go wash your hands. There was a time several years ago also that my daughter, who was in preschool at the time, had pointed out that the characters on a PBS kids show were making love. And when I was realizing I couldn't possibly be understanding what she meant, I ran in to see. And my preschooler was pointing at the screen saying, look, mama, they made love. And there was a little kid on the screen, a cartoon kid, hugging a kitten. And there was this tiny little heart floating over their heads. They literally made love. Friendship is lovely, isn't it? So is parenthood. So when five-year-old James Trin said, that's a lemur, that's a lemur at his daycare, the staff likely thought, sure, kid. Or more likely, while he's probably confused with raccoons, followed immediately by, oh no, is there a rabid creature on the playground? Either way, when kids say there's a lemur in San Francisco, there's no way most adults would just think, of course there's a lemur. But little James Trin was correct. There was a lemur. This is not a native animal to coastal California. They instead live on the island of Madagascar. Lemurs, Latin for ghost spirits, are only found off of Africa's east coast. This lemur was a long way from home, about halfway across the world if we're going to get specific. So after James Trin pointed out the lemur, and the daycare director finally realized that little James was right, and after they called for help, the lemur left the school playground and found shelter in a little playhouse. At this point, zoo officials and animal control were called. So when the parents came to pick up their children, they heard about the lemur, and the teachers had to tell them, actually, your kids are not making this up. Kids, teachers, parents, and I'm sure everyone on the block who was social distancing from their apartments were watching as caretakers arrived and got the lemur, his name is Maki, into a little crate to go home. But home wasn't Madagascar. Home was the San Francisco Zoo, several miles away, which by all accounts was rather easy as far as lemur capture is concerned, since Maki has arthritis and is one of the older lemurs at the zoo at 21 years of age, and he also needs special medical attention. It turns out lemurs can live up to 30 years. But this is not the end of the story. Not only did little James Trin find a lemur, but he helped solve a kidnapping. Lemur napping? Either way. So earlier, before James Trin blurted out, there's a lemur, there's a lemur, a notice had gone out to tell residents of the area that a lemur was missing from the zoo. It might have escaped or maybe it was stolen. Additionally, seemingly unrelated at the time, police had also captured Corey McGilloway on charges of stealing a truck and shoplifting. But on McGilloway's phone happened to be photos of a lemur, one that looks surprisingly like the missing lemur from the San Francisco Zoo. Collecting evidence tying it to the missing lemur, now considered a theft, and James finding Maki all in relatively rapid succession, they were able to also charge Corey McGilloway with burglary, grand theft of an animal, vandalism, and looting. And that's on top of breaking into the zoo and lemur napping the probably napping lemur. So why would Corey McGilloway steal a lemur? Why would anyone break into a zoo and steal a lemur? Well, I suspect he had a bad idea, probably after a night of imbibing on other bad ideas, of breaking into the zoo and stealing a lemur to sell it for money. Or to keep it. 
but it's suggested that Maki escaped Corey McGilloway at some point, found a safe place in the church daycare where James Trin and his friends found him hiding out. One sad note on lemurs. Lemurs are considered the most endangered mammal in the world, with the likelihood of 90% of lemur species going extinct in the next 20 to 25 years due to climate change, deforestation, and illegal trade. Like the possibility of Corey McGilloway stealing the lemur for money in his series of increasingly poor decisions. And the poverty-stricken area that they live, Madagascar, is the only place that lemurs are found naturally. Zoos can help spread the word and help these animals with breeding programs and other resources, but it might not be enough to keep these magical little animals safe. But thanks to the eagle-eyed five-year-old, this one lemur just got to go home and be safe. And as a reward, little James Trin, the hero helper who first spotted Maki and ensured that he could get safely back home, has earned a lifetime membership to the San Francisco Zoo. Good job, James. Nature throwing curveballs is my favorite thing. I mean, we've already talked about how nature gives us a glowing bioluminescent beaver with a duck face, a poison spur, and is a mammal that lays eggs. But as if nature could say, but wait, there's more. There are now dwarf giraffes. Yay! Doesn't this defeat the evolutionary purpose of the giraffe? I am so confused. Go home, nature. You're drunk. I want the confidence of nature on a bender with only spare parts and a deadline. So what are dwarf giraffes and how do they happen? Can we get it and keep it? Can I carry it like a puppy? Well, first, let's talk about what dwarfism is. There are two main kinds of dwarfism. There's disproportionate dwarfism, which is when there's a typical sized torso or a head and smaller limbs. So think of a corgi, our short friends in the dog world with the cutest butts in all of the animal kingdom. Effectively, we humans are breeding for the gene mutation for disproportionate dwarfism in some dogs like the corgi in order to get breeds to look the way that we want them to. And the other is a teacup chihuahua. Their heads might not be the right shape, a little more bulbous, and maybe kind of too big in proportion to the rest of its body. Their legs are bowed. They're not really put together in the healthiest way. The parts are all there, but they are not proportional to the shape and size of what we are used to seeing in domestic dogs. And if you compare that to proportionate dwarfism, think of it if someone just took a giraffe, but then on Google Images just zoomed in and out. All the pieces stayed in proportion to the rest of the giraffe. It was just shrunk by 40%. If you were to see a big photo or a small photo, it would still look like a regular giraffe that you had seen on Nat Geo, in nature books, and in every book that says G is for giraffe. Dwarfism is incredibly rare, no matter how you cut it. And if we were to look at either kind of dwarfism on its own, it would be even more rare. So the fact that this occurred in wild giraffes in Namibia and Uganda in only two cases ever documented. That indicates that it's not going to be likely a gene that will continue to pass on. That's evolution. Sometimes you get a hit, sometimes you get a miss. So two dwarf giraffes, the first such animals known to science, and they are still nine feet tall. These giraffes fell into this category, the category of disproportionate dwarfism. They looked like somebody took a 16-foot giraffe kept the torso and the head basically the same size, squished the long skinny legs into shorter, chunkier legs. The torso looked like they were getting super swole in a fitness club as their chest muscles bulged out in a weird way. And while they were still nine feet tall, hardly a dwarf to us, they are certifiably considered pocket pals in the giraffe community. Because standard giraffes... They are between 16 and 18 feet tall. It turns out, while the headlines of, quote, dwarf giraffes exist, 
they were shared over and over and over on social media with these images of these really amazing creatures. And there are some assumed updates. Both of the giraffes photographed were males, and apparently they did make it to an adult age or almost to adult age, which would be surprising given that they have a significant disadvantage for eating tall food and evading prey. Those long legs help giraffes run away from predators like lions and hyenas, leopards, and African wild dogs. Unsurprisingly, their shorter legs may have made up their chances of escaping predators much worse, as biologists haven't seen the Ugandan giraffe since 2017. It's been four years since they've had a sighting. And the Namibian giraffe? The last time we saw him was in July of 2020. So yes, dwarf giraffes do exist. No, you cannot keep them. They are still barely taller than two Danny DeVitos, half the size of a standard giraffe, and you could fit a stack of 10 of them on top of each other in a standard bowling lane. No, they likely will not be, quote, a thing. This is an example of nature making choices, and some choices are better than others. But I implore you all to go look up photos of these dwarf giraffes. You can see them in the resources in the episode notes of this episode, or just Google this amazing discovery. And that's it for today's episode. A new one will be up for next Monday. I hope you enjoyed this jaunt through some of our favorite animal tie-ins to humanity from Africa and a more fleshed out version, better sound quality version of episode one's cow butt segment. It was fun to revisit some of these. So if you like this show, you could tell a friend, rate, review, all that stuff. Or, truthfully, what I really want from you is to stay curious and find a way to connect with something that you might think is boring not your cup of tea, hard to grasp, by using the things you like to inspire you to dive in fully on these topics. And for me, it's animals. For you, well, it might be something totally different. Though if you're listening to this show and it's not mandated by your teacher, I'd assume you also like animals intersecting with humanity as well. So if you have some ideas or stories that would work together as a collection like today's, just let me know. Bewilderbeastpod at gmail.com tweet at Bewildered Pod, Bewilder Beast Pod on Facebook, and Bewilder Beasts on Instagram. I would love to hear from you. Send a note, leave a review. It really helps, and I read them all. Try Podchaser or iTunes. They really do help. And that's it. And maybe I'll see you on the YouTube live stream on Sunday night. I'm Melissa McHugh McGrath with Mud Stuff Media. Now go get curious. I got today's information from Episode 1, These Bees Are the Bomb on Cow Butt Science. Those resources included Smithsonian Magazine, the BBC, and Nature.com. Segment 2 came from Episode 12, The Parachuting Yorkie That Saved the Day. This one had the lemur segment from Mashable, NBC News, and AP News. Segment 3 today came from Episode 23, Dwarf Giraffes and Two Danny DeVitos, which was... Actually, the segment called Dwarf Giraffes and Two Danny DeVitos. The resources included Mashable.com, VeryWellHealth.com, TheMayoClinic.org, and Link.Springer.com. Links, as always, are in the description of today's episodes, or you could revisit the episodes mentioned above for even more detailed resources. Intro music is Tiptoe Out the Back by Dan Leibowitz, and interstitial music is by MK2. Additional music provided by Pixabay and Freesound.org. Don't forget to like and subscribe, review, and share with your curious friends. Thank you so much for listening. I'll see you next week.